Okay, that's the match. Um, thank you, Evie. Nice to be in Athens again. Uh, my topic is the most touched one between endocrinologists. Why? Because this is a drug which contributes to all cardiologists. And as we know, the number one killer worldwide still are the cardiovascular diseases. That's why we come at the second point here. This is my hospital. I want you to have as guests there, but not as patients. And this is the great fire of Athens. My deepest condolences to the martyrs' families and the Greek people. Also, I will say something that our nation's old name was Phoenicia. And Phoenicia is the bird that comes through the ashes. And I will say to what is the name of this city? Mita? Mati. Mati Aniesti. Let it be resurrected from the ashes. Thank you. This is the thyroid gland, as you know. And uh, where does it rest? And Eva have, uh, gave the apple to Adam, and it's still there, just like an apple. And it's surrounded by all those tissues. Uh, let's take a look at the thyroid system, to, just to recall what it does, and all the things that it regulates, upregulates, and downregulates in all our body. And let's say, amiodarone-induced uh, disorder, it's a general idea. These thyroid dysfunctions are linked to amiodarone, aren't only dysfunctions related to iodine overload or hypersecretion. So the product and the molecule, we have to know it just to make our decisions. It's derived from amphiphilic benzofurane. It has a high, uh, high rate of diffusion and dissociation. The tissue hoarding and the phospholipids of lysosomes, adipose tissue, myocardium, lungs, liver, thyroid, and cornea. As you see, it goes and propagates all the tissues. A long plasma half-life, 30 to 100 days, and the stores remain elevated up to nine months, even after discontinuation. So, uh, as you see, amiodarone versus thyroxine triothyronine. So mark the biological similarities of iodine molecules. As you see, So it's a dexter and an L uh, discrepancy between the two. And this is the pathophysiology and the biochemistry of the thyroid stimulating hormone and the thyroxins. So amiodarone characteristics. It's iodine comprising about 37% of its molecular weight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is 200 milligrams of amiodarone, which is cordarone or whatever, 75 milligrams of its, its organic iodine. So 8 to 17 percent is released as free iodide. Highly lipophilic, concentrated in the adipose tissue, muscle, liver, lung, cornea, and thyroid gland, and has a homology of iodothyronins. Its pathophysiology is the inhibition of one 5 prime deiodinase enzyme, thus decreasing the peripheral conversion of thyroxine to triodotyronine and reducing by the clearance of thyroxine and reverse T3, thus increasing the serum T4 and reverse T3, and thus decreasing the T3 by 20 to 25%, that is by the one-fourth inhibits the entry of thyroxine and T3 in the peripheral tissues, thus increasing the T4 by 40%, and after one to four months, it's inconsistent to amiodarone-induced thyrotoxicosis, inhibition of the 2,5-diadionese enzyme in the pituitary by feedback mechanism in one, three months leads to increase of TSH, not indicative for LT4 replacement in treatment. While we will see soon. Subsequently, the TSH levels normalize in two to three months. The T4 concentration increased to overcome the T3 partial block production, thus the deficit. 
The results will be that the TSH response to TRH may be reduced. Amiodarone and its metabolite, desethyl amiodarone, can act as a competitive antagonist of T3 on cardiomyocytes. So this is the whole scheme, as you see, if you want to take it as a picture. What does it lead to, lead to, lead to, lead to, and end up here? I'm with the wrong characteristics. It's an adrenergic property having alpha blocking aid, uh, properties and beta blocking properties as vasodilation and bradycardia. Let's not forget that it's cytotoxic effect by lysis, by oxidative stress and antigen release. So immunomodulation properties, emergence of sensibilized lymphocyte subsets, as if it's a reiteration for my predecessor, Dr. Popovich, as if she said of the immunomodulation. The characteristics of the population treated with amiodarone, they are the aged ones, they are the fragile ones, and they have relatively iodine deficient, iodine deficiency, which is favoring the emergency of mutations of TSH receptor. Its effects, primary mechanism of action, its antiarrhythmic effect via blockage of voltage-gated potassium channels, resulted in the prolonged repolarization of the cardiac action potential. So it's the secondary mechanism of action, inhibiting the beta receptors and the sodium uh, calcium channels, resulting in a decrease in conduction through AV and sinus nodes. By the way, this is the most, uh, let's say, uh, light mechanism of the cardiologist. They, they uh, always prefer uh, amiodarone. So special uses, it's the only antiarrhythmic agent with almost no negative inotropic effect. It is uh, largely preferred with ejection fraction decreased patients below 40. It's pharmacological model to resistance of thyroid hormones. In hypercholesterolemia, increasing the LDL by 20% after 30 months. This is a long done, um, let's say, survey by Virsinga in 1998. The reduction of hepatic expression of LDL-C receptor gene, this is new comparing to that. So the cardiac characteristic under the influence of amiodarone analogs in hypothyroid subjects, so hemodynamically uh, parameters whenever we do the cardiac ultrasound, and whenever we have decreased cardiac expressions, whenever we have these mutations within our patients, whenever they have thalassemia or <coughs> this uh, mutation, and the amiodarone is uh, on the spot revealed what does it uh, on the spot to these patients. Amiodarone side effects in the lungs whenever uh, it induces pulmonary fibrosis, chronic interstitial pneumonia, organizing pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome and solitary pulmonary mass. By the way, the smokers are very happy to say that you see even with if in, uh, we don't smoke you get the, these diseases. So this is a very nice picture of a pulmonary fibrosis by amrodarone. As you see, the fibrosis masses here, more on the left. And this is done due to amiodarone. Its side effects in the thyroid, which is the bulk of my talk, it can induce hypo or hyperthyroidism, can aggravate any pre-existing thyroid condition. And in the liver, it will mount up the transaminases by two or three uh, uh, times, by interaction of phospholipids, and can induce hepatitis and cirrhosis. The side effects in the heart can make bradycardia or AV block, proarrhythmia if the QT prolongation occurs. Other contributing factors are the hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, the concurrent use of quinidine and prokinamide. These two are the other agents for the antiarrhythmics by the cardiologists. In the eyes, it has corneal microdeposits, optical neuritis, unilateral or bilateral, and can lead to irreversible blindness. And this is a very nice picture of that. As you see, this is a 74-year-old male having this microdeposits. Its side effects on the GI tract, nausea, anorexia, constipation, and on the skin, its photosensitivity and discoloration. 
Uh, under the central nervous system, peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, paresthesia, sleep disturbances, impaired memory, and tremor. In the genital urinary tract, epididymitis, and erectile dysfunction. So amiodarone indications, it's in acute treatment, IV administration. Always take in mind that you can have blood pressure drop. The second line therapy is following unsuccessful defibrillation of cardioversion and epinephrine administration. This is for patients with <clears throat> ventricular tachyarrhythmia uh, and who have hemodynamic, uh, they are hemodynamically stable, but whenever we have pulseless ventricular fibrillation, the drug of choice is amiodarone, and supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, when we have patients with the left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%. Amiodarone indication, uh, it is a long-term treatment by PIROS. It is for the rhythm control and symptomatic AF or uh, underlying heart disease, especially left systolic dysfunction. And whenever we have to restore and maintain the sinus rhythm, it is the drug of choice for ventricular arrhythmias in most heart failure patients with LVF less than 40. It's contraindications. Whenever we have a severe sinus node dysfunction with marked sinus bradycardia, and whenever we have a second or third degree heart block. This is the bulk of our talk. It's coming. Non-iodine allergy we cannot give. Pre-existing lung disease, as we said, it's inducing. And it's interactions. It's an inhibitory cytochrome P450. We will come to that later with warfarin, simvastatin, digoxin, and cyclosporin, flecainamid, prokainamid, quinidone, and sildenafil. This is the amiodarone-induced uh, um, disorders, the laboratory tests for thyroid dysfunction. This is a long list, as we say, that we have to go through it, and not to stop by, let's say, just doing the TSH or the T4, we have to dig deeper. So, first of all, euthyroidism with amiodarone. This is by Berger and Klein Invest back in 1976. The effect of amiodarone was done in 28 days in nine healthy volunteers. This is the first study done. As you see in here, whenever they introduced it, what did it end with? So, the triothyronine went down the T4 had to fill its place, so it went up a little bit, and the reverse T3 went up and met with the T3 thyroid. <coughs> T3, <coughs> excuse me. So, to make things short, this is the treatment duration, this is the time period of the th uh, first three months and uh, more than three months. The FT3 is decreased or low normal, and more than three months, it's low normal. FT4 is increased in the first three months, and then it continues to be high normal or slightly increased. The TSH is slightly increased and then got back to normal and is barely increased or stays high normal. Question, can we predict amiodarone-related dysfunctions? Yes, by seeing if the patient is hypothyroid, and we can do this test, which is the anti-TPO, we can uh, see with the patients that they are inoperable, and whenever they are hyperthyroid, the TSH decreases or near the lower limit of standards. So the goiter transforms into nodules. This is something we have to keep in mind. This is the difference between the two, induced hypothyroidism and induced thyrotoxicosis. And whenever we have an induced hypothyroidism, it will affect 4 to 22% of treated population. It depends on the diagnostic criteria. We have to exclude none or any prior dysfunction and, of course, the prevalence of geographic origin. This is a fine example of the <coughs> uh, geographic origin. As you see, three to seven, uh, let's say 4% to 22% of the treated population by the function, diagnostic criteria, exclusion of not dysfunction and geographic origin. This is in Tuscany, Italy. Okay, as you see, the prevalence here, hyperthyroid, 
is exceeds more the hypothyroid. While in the USA, the hyper is less than, let's say, 2%, and the hypothyroid is, is up to 22%. So whenever we have to tackle the issue, whenever it's coming from the US or from Europe, we have a big difference within them. So hypothyroidism related to amiodarone, it's early onset and promoted by antithyroid autoimmunity. The thyroid function tests we have to keep in mind, these are the two most common we have to do. And then look up to the hypothyroidism and whenever it's increased more than to eight to 10 mu per liter or FT4 is decreased or low normal. What are the symptoms? Fatigue, lethargy, cold intolerance, mental sluggishness, weakness, constipation, menorrhagia, dry skin. So it is not a big deal to just look up for the symptoms. It is a pure hypothyroidism. That's why whenever we do a scintigraphy, uh, we cannot get anything from it. So it is not fixating just by the book. And the hypothyroidism is related to amiodarone, the evalu evaluation of thyroid affinity to iodine. As we looked with iodine 1, 2, 3 and percolate, uh, this is done in the French schools. So as we see their clearance, this is done within the hours and this is done within the minutes. So this is to keep in mind what does it happen whenever we just feed them with these <coughs> uh, Isotopes, yeah, thank you for reminding. So wolf chaikov effect, this is the treatment against hypothyroidism uh, with iodide infusion. It was done a long time ago, but long use of amiodarone leads to amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism. As we see within these two, in here, the iodine is going up. But whenever we're having the hypothyroidism, the iodine is getting down. So this is a, uh, the problem within the hypothyroidism. This is the adaptation whenever we have the production of the thyroid hormones, and this is the iodine intake. This is the, uh, let's say, the defensive mechanism of our body, which was called by Wolf and Tchaikov, and this was the escape phenomena within here. Uh, it was uh, very nicely, let's say, uh, cartouched. And this is the wolf chaikov effect, as it says, protective mechanism against the development of hyperthyroidism. As we see, we then hear the mono uh, iodide uh, thyroxine to uh, 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 double, and then triothyronine uh, thyroxine. Here it stops because we don't have the mono iodine here. It comes and blocks by the two iodines. And this is just reiterating the idea whenever we have the maximum fixation, and this is whenever we have the perchlorate. But unfortunately, in the USA, it is not recognized the perchlorate. And this is the uh, potassium perchlorate by <coughs> uh, Vemo, which I met him in person, and he gave me these slides after permission. So the hyperthyroidism is linked to amiodarone. This is the mechanism. This is the organification disorder. This is the reduction of functional parenchymal mass. So this is the differential diagnosis between the two, if you want to take it in mind. And whenever we have the antithyroid antibodies, it's a must to do. And we have it plus minus, and then we have it two plus. And the prognosis is regression, while in lesion impairment, we have no regression at all. Can amiodarone be continued in the case of dysfunction? Yes, because Whenever you have hypothyroidism, you have to substitute by L-tyroxine, which is convenient. You have to go by gradual introduction. It will improve the quality of life. It will reduce cholesterol. It will uh, increase the need of thyroid hormones. What about patient education? We have to educate the patient to that whenever they have any insidious signs of thyrotoxicosis, just like, let's say, fever, sore throat, jaundice, oral ulcers, because... Most of it, they prefer to look at these signs. The other signs are caught up with the cardiologists. So whenever we look up the cumulative numbers, as we see the hypos and the hypers, the hypos stay the same. Why the hypers, within time, they are exceeding in numbers. So this gives us the second question. 
can hypothyroidism be just changing to hyperthyroidism? We will see that. So the classification, we have amiodarone-induced thyrotoxicosis, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 occurs in patients with underlying thyroid pathology, such as autonomous nodule or goiter, and type 2 occurs in patients with a history of normal thyroid gland, followed by the destructive thyroiditis. So the symptoms are unexplained weight loss, heat intolerance, profiled muscle weakness, unexplained fatigue, emotional liability, frequent defecation, oligomenorrhea in the females, and anxiety, nervousness, and palpitations. It affects 1 to 13% of treated population and contributes 1% of all hyperthyroids. Males are 3 to 1. They are uh, super uh, numbering, the females. The mean age is 56 to 64. What are the predisposing factors? It is the diffuse or multinodular goiter, familial thyroid disease, and geographic origin, as I showed you, and non-antithyroid autoimmunity. <clears throat> so, causative hyperthyroidism, it encounters the 40% of cases. It's revealed in arrhythmic episodes of angina. In case of suspicious nodule, transiently discovered by increase or decrease of amiodarone, hyperthyroidism is induced by abrupt cessation of amiodarone because cardiologists do it so uh, frequently. Sometimes it's followed by hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, we will get despite discontinuation of amiodarone, and then we may have transient hyperthyroidism after cessation of amiodarone because we have a half-life up to nine months. By echography, whenever we look, the difference between the two. This is a diffuse goiter with multinodularity, but the second one we don't have, it's a normal or a small goiter. Whenever we do a Doppler in type 1, as we see the hypervascularization in all three uh, pictures, while in type 2, the small goiter, e even it doesn't have a hypervascularity. Whenever we do a, a technetium uh, maybe scintigraphy, in type 1, there's, a, a, let's say, a, the thyroid tissue, which is uh, very hungry to take up all of that, that's why we see this. In thyroiditis, we have the fixation absolutely nil. And this is once that we have to look further, which is indeterminate type. This was done by PIGA in uh, 2008. And whenever we give the iodine 1 to 3, uh, let's say, replacing the technetium, in type 1, we don't have anything. Uh, a small, let's say, uh, uptake. In type 2, none. Whenever we do a fine needle aspiration biopsy, the cytotoxic lesions, as we see here, this is done by Brennan, and whenever we fixate it with a citrate gallium, we will see this picture. So, to make the long story short, these are the type 1 hyperfunctioning thyroid versus the iodine-induced thyroiditis. The fixation of 1 to 3 iodine is weak. This is nil. The graphy is possible. This is inconclusive. Ultrasound, as we said, we have a small goiter plus minus nodules, hypervascularized and hyperechogenic. While here, it's only one entity. It's hypoechogenic. Interlaken 6, we have normal. We have here elevated because this is a thyroiditis and this is a marker of inflammation. The prognosis is uh, spontaneous regression. Possible prolonged hyperthyroidism. This is spontaneous regression also, but can be transient to secondary hypothyroidism. So the treatment is completely different. We have to introduce here antithyroid substances. Here, the corticosteroids. Can amiodarone therapy be maintained in case of any proven dysfunction? In hyperthyroidism type 1, amiodarone has been continued as long as the use of cycle is interrupted. While can it be done in type 2? High and prolonged doses, professional dose of thyroidal derivatives, we have the conversion blocking of thyroxine to triiodtyronine, already present due to persistent impregnation by am amiodarone. So the equivalents are 
uh, let's take in mind the doses. So carbimazole will be 20 milligrams given three times a day. Thiamazole, 20 to uh, 0.5 tablets, let's say, a day, one morning, one evening, and a half at noon. Uh, propyl thiouracil, whenever you're going to have the equivalent with benzyl thiouracil, it's 50 milligrams is up to 24 tablets per day of benzyl thiouracil. So, hyperthyroidism type 2, if amiodarone has to be maintained, what do we have to do other than treatments? So, back in uh, 2011, JCEM, we took 12 patients on prednisone, metimazole 30 milligrams per day versus 14 patients per chlorate, 500 milligrams twice daily, plus 30 milligrams of metimazole versus 10 patients of prednisone uh, plus perchlorate plus metimazole, triple therapy. So the conclusion was euthyroidism was achieved in all patients. So perchlorate was less effective. The addition of perchlorate to prednisone made no benefit. So the actions in case of persistent and prolonged hyperthyroidism. Can we extend the surveillance period? Of course. Change any medications? Maybe. Surgery? Yes, because I had some patients that were not corrected in any way. So let's have a look back in Mayo Clinic in the past decade. 34 patients were operated. Three of them died, and 10 had complications. This was uh, by Brennan in World Surgery, 2004, and we had plasma exchanges. This is the recent study. With the patients treated with oral amiodarone in the period uh, within 2012 to 2013, they were 621 patients. These patients were diagnosed with thyroid dysfunction and treated with drugs of thyroid dysfunction. And then initiation of uh, uh, amiodarone therapy, 48 patients were taken out. We ended up with 573 patients. Patients without thyroid function test within the three months before the initiation of amiodarone therapy out by 86 patients. So we ended up with 487 patients. These patients without thyroid function tests more than three months after the initiation of amiodarone therapy, we ousted another 170 patients. Okay, 317 patients. As we see, the baseline characteristics of this all in the present study, the thing is that the clinical characteristics of new onset of thyroid dysfunction versus euthyroidism, I have to go by jumping because Evie uh, told me so. These are the tests you have to bear in mind to make them uh, the differential diagnosis. Uh, the, this is the distribution after the amiodarone therapy. This is the most uh, likely slide. So as we see, within less than years, from one to five years, we start up with what? Amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism. This is back in the US, and we go down. And on the vice versa, we have a rise in the hyperthyroidism. This is uh, evidenting the same idea. This is how we developed uh, uh, thyroid dysfunction. And let's end up with this. And whenever you have any patient with thyro uh, TSH more than 10, this is hypothyroidism. You will go to confirming by TSH and measure the T4 and T3 uptake. Whenever you have less than 0 0.1, it's AIT, you will come here. You will initiate the low dose and go up gradually. You will adjust the dose every 6 to 12 weeks. Whenever you have type 1, you will go to metimazole. You will have your thyroidism. You will consider maybe iodine-131. Uh, whenever you have persistent 1, just like the second uh, type, glucocorticoids, Whenever you have your thyroidism, you will only follow up because you will end up with hypothyroidism. And whenever you have this, you have the stabilism, you will only observe. But whenever you have the clinical signs of symptoms, you will go for surgery. Potassium perchlorate. Do I have two minutes or I have to stop? Uh, half a minute. Half a minute. Okay. This is the perchlorate. The French are doing it. Okay. This is done whenever we have unnecessary addition of ATA to corticotherapy. Sodium perchlorate, it is only for diagnostic reasons. This is the uh, potassium perchlorate only used in France. Uh, and what does it do? It is used in moderate hyperthyroidism and severe hyperthyroidism. Whenever you do the triple therapy, 
right away you have doubtful types. So you can either go by the American way or by the European way. You can use the new agent, cholestyramine. Okay, this is the blocking the enterohepatic cycle of thyroid hormones. And the preemptive radioisotopic destruction of thyroid gland. Beware of stimulations by the RHTSH, as you see here. It will end up like this here. Any non-iodized alternatives? Yes, we have the dronedarone. It is non-iodized derivative of amiodarone. The QTC refractive elongation, similar to F uh, amiodarone. Anti-adrenergic properties. It is manufactured by Sanofi. It is approved by the FDA, thank God. And as you see, it doesn't contain any iodine just like here, it's free of iodine, and it will can give all the patients that need uh, amiodarone. This is the same, and I will like to see you in Lebanon soon. This is our country, and why not in my fatherland, Armenia, at the foot of Ararat, where Noah's Ark has been settled. Thank you very much.